kick us off with telling us a bit about your farming system um, and yeah. Okay, so uh, first of all, I, uh, I'm quite happy to be here at Grandsville today uh, and uh, I'm quite impressed by what I can see and all the, the people I can meet. It's a, a good opportunity to, to meet a lot of uh, English friends as well. Um, well, I, um, I start uh, farming in uh, central France on my uh, uh, parents' farm uh, 25 years ago. And it, it is a kind of very, very sandy, very sandy on the top. Um, and uh, the, the, the bottom of the soil is clay and water logging clay. So basically, uh, we run very dry during the summer and uh, during the winter it's extremely wet uh, when we have uh, i mean 80 mil 100 mil of water i mean it's just uh, almost flooding uh, my ancestor on, only found a, a way to farm by making a little furrow every 12 meters and and running the water down the sl slope that way so uh, i was born uh, with soil erosion not knowing it was erosion but that was the way it was yeah. And uh, well, they, uh, we decide to, um, uh, after we, we've seen different people changing their farm practices, we decide that it could be a way, a way to go. And uh, it hasn't been a, a straightforward kind of things, but uh, we managed through and we, we're quite happy today. And uh, what were your, that you've mentioned the soil erosion, were, were there other motivations? What was kind of the, what really made you change your mind about how you're going to farm? Well, it's uh, kind of broad, broad things. I mean, uh, soil erosion was uh, uh, also about cost, being cost effective. Uh, starting to farm uh, was a lot cheaper uh, if you have only to buy a, a second hand tractor and a second hand drill and then to buy a, a large you know amount of equipment um, i would say also i had a chance to work in different countries before i started farming so i was a future i mean i was a student uh, exchange student in the united states for a few years i also worked in australia and new zealand and uh, been in different countries also in europe and uh, uh, south america so i had seen different way of farming so i had I had in some way a kind of open mind at that time saying, well, uh, I'm not gonna, you know, do the way other people do. And I think uh, also kind of curious boy and, uh, and sometime uh, kind of rebel also and saying, well, whatever the other thing about the way I like to go and the way I like to do things, I will do things the way I like to do and I will, I will give a try. Um, I, I will add one more thing uh, about the economy. Uh, well, we didn't have a choice. I mean, they basically, and uh, that's what I, I've seen around many of the pioneer, you know, or in different places. Well, many of those guys, just like me, didn't have any choice. If you wanted to be a farmer in the areas, in the climatic area we were, we, we really had to change and to think out of the frame that conventional farming has no future even it was 25 years ago yeah absolutely um and it, this is very much about a kind of systems approach um could you tell us a little bit about your rotation and your cropping um what your what your farming system looks like this year perhaps this, this year. <laughs> well well it, like i said it, it it has evolved through the years okay um, at the beginning, we were more kind of uh, uh, oriented not to till, and then we we moved to cover crop, and uh, we moved to cover crop uh, around uh, I would say almost 20 years ago. So, and uh, we increased the cover crop. So we are pretty much in uh, having trying to have grain on the farm all the time and uh, the rotation changed a bit you know the crop succession changed a bit on the way so i will describe the letters where we are today um, we also reintroduced animals on the farm uh, in uh, 2012 and um, then it, it did it did increase and it's uh, now uh, 
uh, it, there is quite a few animals on, on the farm. Uh, I also uh, develop, uh, I would say, a social strategy, uh, as I'm, I will not enough on the farm. Um, and in order to share more my equipment with my, uh, I start farming, I mean, uh, sharing things with other colleagues. So um, we start sharing things with uh, a colleague, Christophe, uh, uh, it was in 2003. Then uh, we had another guy, or he came with us. It was in 2012. It was the one with the sheep. And uh, we got a uh, fourth colleague working with us on uh, an associate farm uh, since two years. So now we basically uh, for farmers together for, uh, I would say, almost uh, 1500 acres so uh, so that's uh, this help us to have uh, sharing the labor and also uh, sharing the equipment but uh, every one of us have uh, different uh, skills so it's very interesting to have uh, someone that has skills in agrochemicals someone has skills in the machinery someone has skills in business or someone has have a network to get sometimes some seeds or Myself, my only skill is to be able to speak English, so I can grab information in England. And so it's, that's, you know, uh, it's not only in terms of saving, it's just uh, putting skills together. So the farm has evolved quite a lot uh, that way. So if I come back to my uh, uh, kind of standard rotation now, uh, I, I'm sorry, but I grow, I grow mice which sometimes I call corn. I'm sorry about that. That's <laughs> because of my uh, North American education. So um, corn or mice. And then um, after I usually go for uh, winter barley uh, because usually the corn, the, the, the corn or the mice leave a field quite clean of grasses, uh, winter, winter weeds. And uh, that's helped to uh, get into a kind of uh, winter section without much weeds. So uh, this year I only spread um, a broad-leaved herbicide in spring on, on the barley, no, no glyphosate and no things. And, and then after the barley, which harvest quite early, and now I am able to grow barley because I manage winter water a lot better. Barley was not a crop able on the farm before. And barley helped me to overcome also the drought in spring. At the week we have at the moment in France, my barley is almost finished. So my barley will not suffer from the extra heat we having here, we having there. But my my wheat, no, not. Yeah, <laughs> you see me it's coming. <laughs> almost like to put a sweater, you know. It's summer here in England, but uh, yeah. <laughs> looks like a winter here for me. Uh, but. Uh, my barley will, I uh, mean, this heat wave will not uh, hit my barley, but it would hit my wheat and my triticale. And uh, so that was a good trick to be able to put barley. But we had to manage better my water during the winter, and then the cover crop did help a lot on that. The, then after the barley, because we harvest quite early, we can follow with double crop that I was not able to do. So I, I, I will be next week, I mean, shortly planning buckwheat, okay? And I, in that buckwheat that we usually harvest in October, after the first frost, we are uh, on the seed at the same time, oyster rape, and we had into the oyster rape clover as well. And, uh, and usually when things go right, which is some time, but not all the time in farming, um, I got uh, I got the oyster rape uh, going through, and uh, in next July I will be harvesting oyster rape, and uh, so this uh, uh, by having the buckwheat I got an extra income, and I also protect the oyster rape from insect, uh, thanks to the buckwheat, and uh, and then when we harvest the oyster rape. I got the clover that usually uh, follow underneath and cover the field for the two months and a half of summer. And it's quite easy. I mean, I don't have to uh, drill it again. So basically it's one drilling 
and th three harvest. One is a buckwheat, the second one is a clover, uh, the oysy rape, and the third one is a clover, which we can graze. If things go wrong, okay, that can happen. It just can be a little expensive cover crop, but the risk is very low. Then the next, uh, the next fall, the next uh, autumn, we direct drill uh, wheat into the clover which we have to knock it down a little bit in order to get into the winter. So it's a white clover? What? It's a white clover. White, white clover. And, uh, and, and then we usually terminate the clover with uh, grass, uh, grass uh, not grass, uh, broadleaf herbicide during the winter. And, but the, win the clover really help for the water management because it kept a good soil structure and it, it helped for infiltration. And, and then after the weed that we usually harvest by the 15th of July, we usually plant a mixed cover crop um, that, that we can graze all through the winter before we come back on corn. Uh, on weather fields, sometimes I double the corn, I double the mice. Well, so that's little things that I shuffle like that. But basically you got an idea of my standard uh, rotation. Yeah. Um, but uh, not always follow the rules, okay? <laughs> That's fascinating. So you're taking, because there's a few farmers in the UK that are using buckwheat as a companion crop, but then using the frost, not, well, hoping frost will kill it off or then killing it mm -hmm. off, but you're taking it through to harvest. Yeah. How, how, do, how does that work? Um, <laughs> it, it is, I mean, if you're lucky, if we have, a, uh, I would say, an early uh, <coughs> autumn frost, and sometimes we have some in October. Well, uh, the frost will stop it because the buckwheat is still white plants and it will keep flowering. I mean, if the season is getting longer, so you got few stages of flower and seeds coming on the way. So when you got a frost, uh, kill it, the leaves fall, and then it's quite, a, it's quite easy to, uh, to combine. Uh, if uh, the, the frost doesn't kill the buckwheat, uh, Sometimes windrow, but I don't. But uh, I got some friends they do cut it, windrow it, so it helps to have a easy threshing uh, through the combine. But sometimes I had years that was quite wet, and uh, well, it's not easy to to get through a wet stuff too. But uh, uh, you gotta be prepared when you're going second crop. That uh, you may leave the crop in the in the field. Uh, one year, I say two years out of ten, well, we may not harvest the buckwheat. But it's not a failure because it was uh, an extra things, and it, it still did make its work as a companion crop when prepared <coughs> the oilseed rape as well. So yeah. it's uh, y you got to be prepared when you're doing things like that. That is not hundred percent. Yeah, so it's a change in mentality to mm. to accept that. At risk, and I guess here looking at getting it in as a, early as we can because mm -hmm. the issue is going to be the, the growing season. Um, what about so the the clover? If you looked at kind of keeping that as a permanent cover, have you considered that? I know that's a, a, a practice that's more common in France than here, perhaps. Yeah, some 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 are doing it. Um, it is um, uh, quite uh, interesting in terms of theory. Uh, it is a lot harder to manage. That's why uh, we're not using the term permanent no more. We are <laughs> talking about, we say in French, we call it CDI, which means that uh, cover at indeterminate length. Okay, yeah. Okay. So you can decide. <laughs> okay, so uh, you never know what is going to happen. So we try to keep it as long as possible. But then uh, you got to. to to, to be uh, honest, uh, because if you're trying to keep some kind of cover crop all the time, uh, the cover crop, uh, permanent cover crop, may be fading, and you may have one one, one uh, plants per uh, square meter of alfalfa or clover, while well, the field looks green, but it is not very efficient cover crop. So at some stage, it is better to get rid of it and to install a proper cover crop. Um, and, and then uh, to reach that you have to have a very clean field so you don't have any any problems of wheat by the time I usually say in a, a, a decision uh, system 
uh, if you wonder uh, I have some weeds do I have to spray or not because I want to keep my permanent cover crop or not well if you have weeds you get rid of the weeds and you get rid of the cover crops and you, you know you will start again so getting a little bit of permanent plants into the system is really uh, impressive in terms of uh, 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 improving soils that's something very important it is also very impressive in stuff of uh, nitrogen gain because those plants are there and and usually they lower the nitrogen level in the soil and they have to fix a lot of nitrogen but then you have to accept not being permanent there is nothing permanent in nature okay it just uh, have a little bit of uh, perennial plant into the system uh, and probably the best way to have it is to uh, have a, a, a lay and I have animals and hide all the fields and get it back into a kind of a mixed lay uh, will have to increase the, the, the permanency of, uh, of the plant but uh, in cereals already you know when I go with my clover the white clover I plant it in July and I will probably terminate it sometime between December and February, the, the two years after. So it's already 18 months, okay, that the clover will be here. So that's not bad. If I can just keep it and go one more time, that's fantastic. But to go for three, four years, still dreaming. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, and what, what about in May? So if you, do you put any cover crops in there, or have you considered an understory within no, the maize? No, 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 for different things. Uh, uh, first of all, I'm not, uh, I'm not using irrigation, uh, so sometimes it can be very dry under under the maize. Like last year, I harvest my maize uh, in the eighth and tenth of October. It was fourteen and a half uh, humidity. So the first time ever, I didn't have to dry my, my maize. So imagine, I mean, the field was 100% clean. I mean, no, no weeds, but to grow anything would have been uh, fairer. And also my, my maize in my rotation is my cleaning up uh, plants because we got a large uh, variety of agrochemicals we can use. And also the mice is very suppressive afterwards. So usually I use the mice to have a clean fields. If I have a fields, uh, um, get a little bit harder hand because of weeds, uh, may decide to double the, to double the mice and, and, and just to get it cleaner to restart uh, on a very light uh, herbicide program for the future crops. So uh, putting other plants with mice, well, uh, uh, so far I haven't, I haven't done it. We tried different things, but I haven't done it. Great. Okay, well, I've asked lots of questions. Who, have we got anyone in the audience who's got a, a question for Frederick? We've got a mic coming around. Thank you. Hi, David White. Um, you talked about terminating cover crops and we're interested in minimising the use of glyphosate now in the UK and I know it's more of a problem in France. Uh, are you using light cultivations and, and if you are, how does that affect your soil health and structure and your farming system? Well, so far um, uh, I do terminate when I need uh, with glyphosate and with other herbicides. We sometimes mi mix glyphosate with whether 240 or other herbicides to uh, be better on broad leaved. Um, usually, I, I, if I come back on the glyphosate, uh, I didn't put any tillage back on the farm to reduce the herbicide or to reduce the need of glyphosate. Okay, uh, for a few things, uh, the. The first thing is, uh, I think, is still uh, uh, efficient, more efficient to use an herbicide than shallow tillage. Shallow tillage is, uh, uh, would bring, maybe will get rid of some weeds or the cover crops, but will uh, also bring some new in downward things and uh, probably will not help. And I've seen, uh, once again, this year we had a 50 mil of rain uh, two weeks ago. And it was quite dry, 
my, my neighbors doing some kind of tillage. They were in a wet side and uh, ourselves the water went in just like that. And now with this heat, heat wave, I'm pretty happy that I soaked the water. Uh, so I'm still comfortable and until it is not completely banned, okay, I don't want to uh, it's, uh, say to, to load on the sword before the end of the combat, you know, so I keep <laughs> using the glyphosate and, and the herbicide for, for this. But if you look back at my rotation, uh, well, usually when things go fine after the mice, when I put the barley, I, I can most of the time go without glyphosate. And, and then when I put the barley and I put the oil, the oil seed rape and, and the and the, uh, the buckwheat after the barley, so I usually do that straight after harvest. Usually after the barley, it's very clean, <coughs> and and so I can direct well straight. And then I grow for grass herbicide, a uh, graminicid side, uh, in the middle of the summer. So because you got the volunteer of the barley, and that could be a kind of a nuisance for the. So. Uh, then that I can manage, and because I am after mice, I got a lot of summer grasses in usually coming, so I can manage that by a summer grass herbicide, okay. And and then I may go for a grass herbicide on on the oily rape afterwards, so really quite stunt my grass problem, or, but which I don't have. I mean, you've been on the farm, and uh, sometimes you guys were wondering, do you have red grass, or do you have broom? And, and, well, we, we can have, but... Uh, and then the where I n still need, for sure, glyphosate, is when I turn my cover crop back into mice. Because we usually graze that, but after grazing, well, the animals do a fantastic job on that, but uh, there are still some... Uh, not quite grass, but uh, uh, ray grass and uh, and brome and that, that's getting through the winter and it's not 100% clean fields and uh, it's 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 quite easy today to go with glyphosate. If tomorrow we have to do some shallow tillage or whatsoever, uh, uh, I don't know uh, what, but uh, I, I wait until I'm forced to do it to do it. Any more questions out there? Hi there. Um, in our part of the world, we're experimenting with strip till maize. I don't know if you could offer any tips on how to fertilize the crop and other um, problems that we may come in to come against. Okay. So you want me to comment about strip till? Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, we've been strip tilling for uh, something about ten years. Okay. Cool. And but we we kind of reduce slowly the strip till. Um, uh, strip till could be a good good uh, strategy uh, when you are in between your soil is not ready yet uh, but uh, don't overdo strip till uh, first you have to have good soils to make strip till works you know if your soil is compacted and is not in good health uh, strip till will help but could be a heavy risk because the water could could get in the strip and get the strip very muddy if you have heavy rain like you had uh, couple of days ago so uh, let's make this quite tricky so don't over go with the strip till and and then uh, uh, we went uh, shortly by we we call that uh, pre pre seeding so with some time in the soil when your slot is not properly tilt you know to put the seed uh, we could accept to go once with a planter uh, in order to push the trash a little bit and use the disc to open the soil and make make the line and come uh, one or two days afterwards and replant it onto it um, and sometimes it really it really helps you know to have your crop density and your emergence straight um, in in mice uh, the 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 maize the, the if you look at the at the pyramid of of success in in mice the most important thing, it's uh, beside the fertility and weed management, is uh, uh, the even emergence of the plants. 
So if you want to have a very even emergence of plants, uh, you have to have a very even, uh, you know, furrow and going once would help. We changed uh, last year, I mean the first year the uh, corn planter, we modified and we put, uh, we have a, a disc in the front which is a, a, just a blade to cut in, yeah. to cut the cover. And when it's green, it's quite easy to cut. You know, you go through and, and cut it. And uh, as it's sandy, I mean, you, we tied the spring so we can go deeper than the furrow, okay? Um, and then it, just in front of the double disc, we got a little tire <coughs> that was a stone pusher, you know, the they had before. So, and we had a little bit carbide kind of things on it. So this do, a little bit of tillage at the depth of the seed and 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 this doesn't plug i'm surprised that's a, a a farmer you know store that because the wheels on the back take the trash if there is some trash and 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 then we still have to fix up uh, the wheels in the bank you know in order to the closing wheels in order to have a better job that it's not uh, uh, don't stay open uh, but uh, basically we are very happy of this and uh, we we are getting away from uh, strip tilling in many cases we have also to think and it is the same thing for sugar beet most uh, you know mice and sugar beet are usually looked at a plant that need a very healthy and tilt environment but usually those plants are able to manage themselves pretty well a lot better than we think uh, by the time you you get the start good and you get the fertility right, you mean, because we apply fertility, I mean, close to the seed when we plant, and when we finished, I mean, all the nitrogen is in the field as well. So if you if apply the fertility right, I mean, uh, you can go a long way with uh, some kind of no-till. Uh, use urea or? I will use uh, urea in, uh, I blend a mix of uh, DAP uh, and, uh, it's DAP and also it's a mix of fertilizer that I get from sugar beet industry. So there is a little bit of nitrogen in it, there is a little bit of potassium, magnesium and uh, also a lot of sulfur. And, and there is also trace element in it. So I mix 50 kilograms of that and 50 kilograms of DAP. So let's make a kind of 20, 20, 20, 20 kind of blend. And um, I if I got time, I didn't take the time this year. I had micronutrients with it that I pinched from vineyards industry. And I had into it, and and just to have the the better fertility from the start. You know, it's the BB corn, it's the BB sugar bee. You have to have the best fertility just at the beginning, and then I cover with urea, and and I apply my urea uh, as soon as possible. So it just could be just after planting. Usually the strategy in conventional is to apply urea when, when the mice is six, eight weeks but tall. But uh, I, don't, I, I, I mean, if you know till and you have cover crop, you don't wait. Because uh, uh, first of all, you're just looking at a decent rain to get the urea into the soil and limit the volatilization and also uh, a lot of things will grab the nitrogen first and will give the nitrogen back slowly. So uh, it, it will slow down the nitrogen release even if you apply uh, shortly after seeding. Is your urea broadcast? Uh, broadcast. Broadcast. Fantastic, thank you. Um, we are pretty much out of time. Um, unfortunately, we've got, and we've got another session starting. Maybe we can take one very quick question, um, but we're, yeah, and then do feel free to come and ask Frederick questions afterwards as well. Um, Frederick, my name's Rob Coleman. I'm from uh, Base Ireland. And I was just wondering, um, you know, on your journey in terms of when you started and your goals and your ambitions that you set at the start and how the journey has changed those and maybe what are yours now for five or even 10 years, just sort of for people looking for guidance <laughs> on their own journeys. Have you sort of ever, you know, sort of set those and set out and have they changed and evolved and where are you now for the next five years and what are you trying to do in your goals and ambitions? You want to, to know where I want to go in the next 10 years? It was a quick question. <laughs> well, uh, come, and, come and check in 10 years if I fulfill. Um, uh, I would say I'm still, I'm still ambitious and, uh, and uh, 
first of all, uh, it is probably a, a part of the, if I understand more globally, uh, further I go, more things I find interesting to incorporate into my system. You know, when I first started, and I come back for the history, I thought no-till was fantastic and no-till was the revolution, I will go only no-till. And then no-till, I found out that no-till was just a door. I mean, to uh, to leave behind the the old ancient concept we, I learned in school about agriculture and, and, and to open to plenty of new concept. And that helped me to meet different people around the world and around France and with uh, fantastic ideas and and uh, the laboratory, the research laboratory of agriculture at the moment is in uh, conservation agriculture networks. And it's amazing, it's amazing the numbers of great ideas people have and are trying to, uh, trying to implement and succeed also implementing. So this means that every, every not day, but uh, every year, uh, I have more things that I would like to put on the farm. My biggest worry at the moment is uh, I'm uh, 56 and uh, I need uh, another life of farming <laughs> <laughs> to put everything. So 10 years is very short, <laughs> you know, looking at that. Um, the, but if I come back to, uh, then you have to classify and to see what you would like to do. The, the uh, one thing I would like to really implement uh, quite fast in the near future, and it may may happen pretty quick. It's to um, have another uh, farmer or two other farmers or or ladies working working with us uh, independently. Uh, probably I like to have, and we were very close to have one uh, starting. Have some a guy uh, producing uh, vegetable on the farm. And uh, he spent one year with us, but uh, he didn't, didn't stay. He wanted to uh, go away and, uh, and, and, and train himself more. So maybe he will come back, I mean, in one or two years. Uh, but I had already uh, uh, one hectare reserve for him. And the idea was, uh, because it is very hard to produce a vegetable all the time by yourself, and so like that he could have the the equipment of the farm yeah. and and also a vegetable production is very harmful for the soil so if you do it the same way all the time at the same place uh, it's better to move and change areas and so it, we would have given him this opportunity to do that and also I could produce in my cover crop uh, ancient legume, ancient uh, vegetable, uh, I mean black radish and all kind of thing that he would just grab and, and sell and if you think uh, someone grabbing a radish one per square meter, I sell it 10 cents a radish. So, and he can sell a, 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 a euro and a half the radish, so he's making a good deal, but I'm still making a great deal out of my cover crops. Uh. And the second, the second thing was probably adding chicken to the system, but to add chickens, we need uh, mobile chicken. Uh, uh, we need someone the, that will be his business. So uh, that's uh, something we're looking, and that may happen in uh, coming years. And the third third thing is to plant grapes and wine in order to uh, uh, start making uh, wine again, but uh, with conservation agriculture. So it would be cover crop and crops in between the raw vine. So that's probably that's one of the of the three goals we have so far. Fantastic. But I'm sure in the 10 years coming, we will have more ideas, so... Uh, watch this space. <laughs> but Fascinating. Yeah, I think there's so much in that collaboration idea. I think there's a, a lot more happening in the UK as well with farmers collaborating for to get livestock back on farms and, and uh, also, yeah, bring in different enterprises. So, yeah, fantastic. Um, so we're out of time. Thank you so much, Frederick. Um, do stick around. Um, ask Frederick some questions afterwards. Um, we've also got another session starting in about 10 minutes um, on integrated pest management. Um, 